Hello there, we're back in the pine woods. Today I'm going to talk about the different ways I go backpacking. Well, if I'm going to talk about backpacking, I'm going to have to start with the big three, which is your pack, your shelter, and your sleep system. Let's start with this pack. When I'm backpacking, my pack size is going to be between the 40 and 70 liter range. I'm not really going to promote any specific products or anything like that. This is really, that's all personal choices. And uh, I backpack in a variety of different ways based on length of the trip, you know, weather conditions, kind of what I'm out there for. This is my largest pack. It's a 70 liter pack. I'm going to set it down. So when it comes to your pack choices, it comes down to how much you want to bring with you is your first thing. When I'm choosing the pack I'm going to bring for a hike, I'll gather together everything that I'm going to bring on that hike and then I'll choose my pack last. You can kind of think of it as like a piece of luggage, but you only get one. <laughs> a few other considerations in choosing a pack are cost, comfort, and durability. And then of course, sometimes you just, it's like kind of buying a car or an item of clothing. You just see something and it really speaks to you, so to speak. And uh, you're gonna get it based on appearance and a good fit. Make sure it's a good fit. When you're buying a pack, try it on in the store if, or <clears throat> if it's an online purchase, make sure it's easy to return. You wanna put some weight in that and walk around in it for a while. Without any weight in it, it, you really can't get a sense of how it's going to feel on a hike. Oh, and I almost forgot. One other important consideration is the weight of the pack itself. We'll talk about base weight later, but the big three composes the majority of the weight on your hike, your weight of your sleep system, your shelter and your pack, and then the weight of your food and water is going to be almost the entire weight of everything you're carrying during a hike. And that's important to a lot of people. Let's get this set up and we'll talk about shelter systems. Okay, so I only use one of two different types of shelters, either a tarp or a tent. <clears throat> when tarp camping, this is a square tarp, and I prefer a square tarp, a 10 foot by 10 foot. And you can just make so many different configurations out of this. A lot of the time it's going to be based on weather. This is almost storm mode. It's set really low, really wide. I could get a lot of stuff under here, like all my gear with me. Now this would of course be more centered under the tarp. And uh, excuse my pitch, I just did this rather quickly. <clears throat> if I was going to actually camp here, I wouldn't be on top of tree roots or sticks and pine cones and all of that would be cleared out. But I wanted to pull this to the front to show you that all you need is the tarp for weather protection and some kind of ground cloth. This is the ground sheet for my tent. And then I'll do an air mattress or a closed cell foam pad, something like that, just for comfort and a sleeping bag and a couple of pillows. And that's it. This will get you through quite a lot. You can bring the sides all the way to the ground it helps shed the water away. Make sure you're on a little bit of high ground. You don't want to be in an area that's going to puddle, that's for sure. If it's going to be really bad, you can make an enclosed tarp shelter. And if the weather's really nice, just keep it wide open. You don't even really need, well, that's going to lead me to cowboy camping, which I will also use the tarp for, and I'll explain why in a minute. Let me get set up for that. Okay, so now we're looking at cowboy camping. When I first started cowboy camping, I just threw a piece of plastic or a ground sheet down of some kind and uh, usually a closed cell phone mat. And depending upon the temperature, a uh, sleeping bag, and that was it. Until the weather forecast was wrong and I was rained on. And that's another story. <laughs> so now I bring a tarp. And the reason why is if it's going to be a heavy dew or rain, I could just flip it over me, read a roll in it, so to speak, wrap it around you, and stay out of the weather. <laughs> and it's happened a few times since then. 
All right, so this is a great setup for the warmer months. So we have the tarp, we have an air mat, we have a sleeping bag liner. So this is basically a sheet that goes, you know, it's, a, it's a, like a sleeping bag, it's a bag, and it goes inside your sleeping bag and it's supposed to add roughly between 5 and 10 degrees of comfort to that sleeping bag. And the uh, other purpose for that is to keep the inside of the sleeping bag clean when you're a dirty hiker. You don't really want to wash the sleeping bag any more than you have to. And a pillow. This is a great summer setup. I actually prefer this during the winter. And the reason why is uh, ticks. You know, here in the Midwest, they're pretty bad most of the time. So. The uh, third option I have is the tent. Uh, there are other options, bivy bags, hammocks, those types of things. I just uh, only use these methods. So I'll be back in a minute. Okay, so this is a little one-man tent. I've got the mat and the sleeping bag inside for size. You can see it's, um, it's small. Pretty much my head and feet are at the ends of the tent. There is a little bit of room in here for gear. I could usually get all of my gear in here. It's a double wall tent, so you have an inner, which is almost all mesh, which is great when it's warm. If you're not worried about rain, this is all you need for the night. It has it's a single door, and uh, when it's colder or you have to worry about rain, it has a fly that goes over it, opens up here with the vestibule area, so you can't cook while your fly is closed in the rain. Um, I don't do it. I, it just makes me nervous, but I know people do. So what I would do is determine where I want to lay this out, lay in there, see if it's comfortable. If not, I just pick it up and move it to another spot. Once I find a comfortable lay, then I'll go ahead and stake everything out, throw the fly on, and uh, there you go. All right, moving on. Okay, so I know I'm talking about the way I backpack, and this isn't really a backpacking option anyway, but if you just went out to camp and you had the time, you could do something like what this person did here and build a debris shelter. Uh, on this, the bones are good, but it needs a whole lot more debris. It looks like it's been here for a while and something like this does need continual maintenance to stay effective. But with enough debris on top, it can be waterproof and it can be quite warm. Kind of looks cool. <laughs> So as you can tell, I really don't do things the same way every time. I like a lot of variation and just different experiences when I go out. Most of the time when I go out now, it's just for one overnight, just two days and one night. I don't do the lengthy trips that I used to do before I started making YouTube videos. I'm not really sure how that would go. That would, seems like it would be kind of difficult to make the miles and record it at the same time, though I know a lot of people do. So let's talk about food and cooking. As you've seen in most of my videos, there are different ways to, that I do it. Uh, one easy, simple way is with a gas stove. So many different options. I like a jet boil. It's really fast. And uh, this little piece right here will turn orange and it kind of climbs up to the height of the water from the bottom to the top as it reaches a boiling temperature. Once it's all orange, I know that this is at a boil. I can also tell because there will be steam coming out of the vents in the lid. One of these canisters would last me three weeks maybe on the trail. Then there's a stick stove, which is actually a great option for backpacking if you have a little bit more time at camp and you're in an area that's mostly dry. It's a, a stick stove or a twig stove. Just take small pieces of wood. You uh, fill it up, get it burning, then you continue to load additional wood through the front or you can through the top. And I would probably, if I was worried about weight, just have a titanium cup. I generally bring a billy pot like this with a handle, boil water. I could cook something in this. This is pretty much, I could cook in this and drink out of it, but I use it just for boiling water. This stick stove breaks down into this small bag it's very lightweight, under a pound, I don't know the exact weight. Okay, now let's talk about one other method. There are other ways of cooking alcohol stoves, all different types of ways of cooking. These are, once again, this is how I do it. Uh, when I used to hike more miles, 
then I would cold soak. I usually use this uh, Talenti jar. So you would put your you know, dehydrated or freeze dried your dehydrated food into here, add liquid one to two hours before you were going to eat, throw it in your pack and hike till you were ready to eat or till you got to camp. And then I would usually eat and then hike maybe an hour, hour and a half on before I would pitch camp. I like freeze dried meals. Um, they're pretty pricey. They're really tasty. All you do is boil water, add it to the bag, stir it up, wait usually 10 to 15 minutes, stir it again and eat. And most of these are made for two people. I have problems eating a whole one, although I do every time. Uh, another thing you could do is just bring lightweight food like ramen noodles, um, nor sides, mashed potatoes, those types of things. In fact, there's a thing, uh, I would never do this twice, called a ramen bomb where you take ramen and you mix it with a package of Idahoan mashed potatoes or whatever and uh, mix those together and you eat it and man, it sits in your gut the whole night. It's a lot. It's a lot of weight. Um, and then, of course, any kind of snacky stuff, you know, meat sticks and stuff like that you can bring along. When I'm out, I almost always have coffee for breakfast. Sometimes I won't. It depends upon how many miles I want to make that day. But when I'm not really pushing a big mileage day, then I'll go ahead and cook something for breakfast or at least coffee. I'll always snack for lunch, and either I'm taking a really quick break or I'm hiking while I eat. And then I'll cook a dinner. I almost always cook a dinner just because it, you know, having some warm food in your stomach at the end of the day and something high calorie really does bring on a good sleep. All right, let's move on to water. Water. Probably the thing I think about the most on the trail other than the miles that I'm trying to make that day. I'm talking about longer backpacking trips generally. Nowadays, I know my miles are pretty low and I'm not concerned about that. <clears throat> but I see in my future that I'll be back to doing some longer hikes, longer trails. So this is pertinent. So how much water I bring with me depends upon how far I have to carry between opportunities to get more water. So between streams, lakes, ponds, you know, it depends upon the season. In the spring or the fall, when you get a lot more rain, you can scoop water out of a puddle. Uh, I've done it. And, you know, it tastes like it came out of a puddle when you drink it, too. <laughs> water is pretty heavy. It's a little over 8 pounds per gallon. And it takes up a lot of volume in your pack, too. So I try to get away with carrying as little as I feel comfortable carrying. You usually around here one to two liters and that's my max. Uh, I have had times where I've carried more. I may have 20 to 30 miles between opportunities to get more water. So I definitely carry more at times like that. There are a couple of different ways to treat it. I usually use a filter. You saw last week I had a Sawyer filter on a water bottle. Another one is this Catadine Be Free. So many options out there. These are the ones I have. This is a one liter bag. So just fill up the bag, squeeze it through into the clean water bottle, and then I can fill this up again. And now I'm carrying two liters of water. All I need to do is just, I put a sport cap from a smart water bottle on this, is just squeeze it through the filter and I can drink water right out of this bag. Um, it's not a bad idea to have a backup way to filter. These do sometimes get clogged up or fail or the bag could puncture, something like that. And in that event, my backup is boiling. So you can always boil water and um, you know, it does affect the taste a little bit, but it makes it safe to drink. And there are chemical treatments, different types of chemical treatments that are small, very lightweight, and those are a really good option too. And that's what most people do for a backup. And now I wanna talk about my ditty bag and I'll be right back. So I made some notes for this video. I had to. My short-term memory, maybe my long-term memory, according to my wife, neither one are very good. So I'm going to use my notes. A ditty bag is a small bag. This would actually be large. I like mine to be a waterproof dry sack. And it's for all the 
small stuff, miscellaneous items that you're going to bring with you for a hike. And that's why I'm going to my notes. All right, so I would throw my first aid kit in here, which I covered in last week's video pretty well, but quickly I would throw in, well, I have tweezers on my Swiss Army knife for ticks, thorns, those types of things. I have uh, ibuprofen, Benadryl, bandages, body glide, luco tape, and hand sanitizer. Then I would have a small repair kit, which would be tenacious tape. Think of it as kind of like duct tape on steroids. And that's great to say you have a puncture in your air mattress or somehow you have a hole in your tent or something like that. It's great to repair that. Um, I would have a needle, a sewing needle, and I would use my dental floss as the thread for any kind of repair that required that. I've never really had that yet, but I could see that. Uh, one, one thing I have used duct tape for, which I would use the tenacious tape for today, is um, when you're on a long hike and there's no place to resupply and your shoes are just worn out and your soles are separating from the rest of the shoe and they're flopping around and just wrap it around it and it'll last a while it'll actually last two or three hundred miles <laughs> don't ask me how I know then um, there would be toiletries so a toothbrush toothpaste dental floss and a poop kit the poop kit I would keep separate because they're larger items with the trowel and all that everything else goes in here then I'm going to have another bag that's going to be a dry bag that's waterproof for electronics and in that I'm going to keep my headlamp or if it's getting towards evening I'll keep it in a side pocket or a hip pocket something like that where I could get it quickly uh, power bank which I probably should have brought one of those I'm pretty sure you all know what a power bank is though and that's for recharging my phone and batteries those types of things and uh, then on a longer hike where I'm going to have a chance to stop somewhere that has access to electricity I'll have a charging port and some cables and then I'm going to bring extra batteries for anything that, that would need that, like this camera, for example. Um, I didn't bring anything else out here to show you, so I'm going to just review my list. I'll try and make it quick. Clothing. Clothing is totally dependent upon your season and your weather. I always have something for the rain. Um, actually, as long as I'm on an established trail that's pretty wide open, I like a small travel umbrella. It, it works great because it's not hot and confining and it covers you know your you and your pack and if I'm wet below the waist well I'm not really too concerned about that as long as it's not cold uh, when it's cold I'm going to have rain pants and a rain jacket or when it's warmer I'll have a poncho just because it's better ventilated um, I usually, on a longer hike, I'm thinking like a week or longer, I'll have an extra pair of underwear and an extra pair of socks. That's about it for extra clothes, though. Uh, let's see. So how do I decide what I'm going to bring? Well, the primary thing I'm going to consider is the length of my hike. And uh, that determines everything I'm going to bring. If I'm bringing a lot more food, I'm going to make everything else smaller my shelter choice is going to be smaller etc um, the second is the type of experience I'm looking for so lately I've been looking for kind of leisurely hikes um, looking for them to be scenic and uh, I've done some cooking over a campfire which is a whole nother thing right there you've got uh, more of a cook kit with you and a grill and um, it's really a lot of fun I like bringing fresh food if I'm just doing an overnight it's a great option and it tastes better and it's I'm sure healthier much less uh, expensive it's more affordable too and then the third option is weight versus comfort am I out there for a really long hike and I'm trying to just kill the miles well I'm all about the weight I want it to be as low as possible and uh, do I want it to be more leisurely and relaxed and maybe I'm just there to check out the scenery and be out in the woods then I'm gonna be a lot more comfortable I'm going to be carrying more it's going to be heavier I'm not pushing the miles and so it's not that big of a deal the only time I worry about weight is if I know I've got to really make big miles every day then I'll worry about weight otherwise I don't so I think that leads us to almost the end, maybe my last subject.
it does. So my last subject is how I hike and how a lot of people hike and how I have hiked in the past. So let's talk about ultralight hiking for a second. Ultralight is where your base weight is going to be 10 pounds or less. Generally, there's no hard and fast definition, but that's what's generally accepted in the hiking community. So your base weight is everything minus consumables. So everything, including your pack, that you're carrying minus food, water, and fuel if you have a fuel stove. So that's got to be 10 pounds or less. Then you're an ultralighter. Ultralight gear can be pretty durable and it's almost always pretty expensive. For example, that one man 10 I showed you, I think I picked that up for 90 or $100 maybe. And I've had it for several years and it still looks brand new. It's uh, been a great tent. Now a one man tent, ultralight tent, and it would probably be a trekking pole tent if that's what I'm going for, is going to run me in the six to $800 range. It's a big difference. Uh, of course, it's going to be a pound or less in weight. The trekking poles I'm not going to count is the weight of the tent because I'm going to hike with those every day. Um, it's going to be a single wall tent too. So my tent is a double wall, which I really prefer because first of all, I don't have to have a fly on it and I can have really good ventilation if the weather permits. Second, a double wall tent has much less tendency to condensate. I'm Really, I don't think I've ever had an issue with condensation on my double wall tent, but a single wall tent, condensation is, is a big concern right there. Uh, let's see, what else did I have for ultralight hiking? All right, so for me, it's hard to justify the cost for what I'm doing for ultralight gear, but if I was going to do a long hike, like a through hike on a long trail, then I would really only do that as with ultralight gear. It just makes so much sense to do it that way. Um, a lot of people will do ultralight even on a short three, four day hike. Um, I don't, I can still push heavy miles with 30 pounds or less on my back. And that's, that's counting everything, food, water and everything. And it doesn't bother me. Um, if I had issues, say with my feet or my knees or something like that, then I would change, change over to ultralight and try and reduce my weight as much as possible. And I'm going to tell you a story about extreme ultralight. Okay, so extreme ultralight is where your base weight is five pounds or less. And I did a 119 mile hike in one week on the Ozark Trail. <sighs> Try it out, extreme ultralight. So I went to survive, I, I did this just on the cheap, okay? And so I went to the uh, Survive Outdoors longer site and I got a basic bivy sack and um, blanket. So what their stuff is, is it's got like a mylar inner with usually an orange so that you could be seen in an emergency, pretty easy outer. So the bivy sack and the blanket probably together, I doubt weighed a pound. The bivy sack was not like a bivy bag where it covers all of you. The bivy sack maybe went up to my chest and I had a Z-Lite closed cell phone pad. So I laid the pad down, crawled under the bivy, uh, laid the blanket down, crawled into the bivy sack, and then threw the blanket over me. And I did this in October, so it was pretty cold at night. And I just wore a ton of clothes. That's it, you know. Um, and I think I had a 40 liter pack. And that was actually it. I, because you don't count in your base weight your food and water. I didn't bring any toiletries or first aid or anything. I didn't have a cell phone on me. Well, yeah, cell phones were around back then. Um, so I had my sleeping pad, the sack, the blanket, my pack, and it was almost all taken up with food and water. So I had no resupply options on this hike. It was one week, 119 miles. I'll never do it again, but the memory is awesome. You talk about type two fun. Man, every day, almost every day that sun came out, we, we did have, I did have two rainy days that were just a nightmare. Oh, I brought a travel umbrella on that one. I did bring the umbrella. I remember the rain was so hard and it was so dark that I couldn't see the trail. I had to do like six miles in that. And I wasn't sure I was on the trail any of that six miles. Fortunately, I was. Um, 
I got really blistered up bad on that hike. I remember my, I mean, my shoes were full of blood. It was, it was, it was challenging, but uh, the memories are there now. So that's really it. I mean, I've talked about different ways I've hiked in the past and I pretty much have shown you how I hike now. And um, things are a lot more relaxed and leisurely making these videos. I'm really enjoying it. I didn't at first think I would because um, usually back before I did these videos, hiking for me was all about the challenge of making the miles. Did, did I do 20 to 30 miles every day? Um, you know, hence the blisters. Um, and no first aid kit to treat them with either. So um, it was always the, the mental game of can I, can I do it? Have I got what it takes? And I kind of moved away from that. And now I'm just out here to have a great time. And uh, it took a bit to adjust to it, but not that much. I, I, I'm in love with it now. I just want to go out and have a good time. And I want to bring you along with me and share it with you. And I really appreciate that any of you choose to come along for this. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. I do, and I just want to want you to be a part of it. So that's it. That's how I backpack. I think this is the last video I've got in what I'll call the Ragney series, unless Ragney comes up with some more ideas or some more questions, which I really hope she does because I've enjoyed this quite a lot. So thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.